everyone, I'm Rick Jenkins and I'm coming to you today on behalf of SC Biz News, the media company that serves high-level business executives in South Carolina. Welcome to SC Biz TV and another episode of Coffee With. Today I'm having coffee with Abe Varagis. Abe and I will be discussing how modernizing technology is essential if we're going to keep up with this, these fast-changing times. Abe is the president and CEO of Merit Technologies, which is headquartered in Greenville, Founded in 2009, the company helps small and medium-sized businesses incorporate IT disciplines in a wide variety of areas. Welcome, Abe. Thank you, Rick. Glad to be here. It is good to see you, buddy. I haven't seen you in a while. Of course, I haven't <laughs> seen a lot of folks in a while. It's, it's, been a, it's been a weird year, but I appreciate you taking some time to join us. Yes, sir. We're going to be discussing a really big topic today that's going to have a whole lot of moving pieces and it's going to be a far-ranging conversation and I certainly look forward to it even though I am not a techie guy myself. I know you'll set me straight. We're going to be talking about modernizing business technology which seems to be something that we need to do every daggone day to keep up with things. But before we do that, I want to talk about you. Where are you from and how did you find your way to South Carolina? Well, um, originally, um, I got my degree in computer science in Ohio. Bowling and, Green. Uh, Bowling Green, Ohio. Know it well. Correct. Thank you. That uh, got my undergraduate, and then uh, what brought me to Greenville, South Carolina, was, was an IT job. And then along the way, I picked up an MBA from Clemson. Right. And uh, that's what I've done for 30 years. Uh, we loved Greenville. I've had a number of opportunities to leave the area with uh, career opportunities, but uh, we fell in love. This, this is home. Area. This is home, raised my three kids here, and uh, that's how I got here. What year did you come? 1996. 96, so it was, uh, what, 13 years later that before you opened Merit, right, right? Right, And speaking of Merit, how did you come up with that name? Well, that's a very good question. <laughs> so my business partner and I sat and we talked about what we could do for the SMB market, the small, medium-sized market. Um, and we thought about excellence. You know, we, we wanted to be excellent in how we treated our customer, each other, and processes and all of that. But the word excellence is rather big, a mouthful. Right. Right. So we kept bouncing around and then all of a sudden the word merit pops up, right? right? And this happened at the Starbucks on Pelham Road. Okay. And it's you know quintessential napkin, write number of names on it, and finally we settled and on it. you knew there. you had it as soon as it hit. Yes, sir, we That's did. That's perfect. That's awesome. That is perfect. Okay, you all provide a wide array of services, right. and I want to get into that. You're an MSP, um, and I want to get into that in a second, but you also have a division of your company called Merit Software. Tell me what that is. Yeah, so my background is software development. You know, I was a software engineer, so I just knew how to manufacture, if I may, software. We have a 4D process. We start with a discovery conversation. You want to write some software, you're going to tell me what you're thinking, and then we move into a design phase. You and I will co-work together because I need to figure out what you really have in mind. And then we go into the development phase. And then we do the deployment. And so Merit primarily does, Merit Software primarily does uh, LAMP stack, which is a lot of PHP work, uh, web-based application. We do a lot of mobile applications as well. And we do some .NET, which is the Microsoft's platform. Mm -hmm. But uh, this allows us to offer full services to our, our customer base. Got it. Also, as a uh, managed service provider, you offer basically anything. As a matter of fact, somebody told me not too long ago that you all are the Green Beret of IT companies in South Carolina, which is great. I love to hear that. Um, so you, you guys can do everything from cloud migration to offering CIO services, right? But g give us that brief rundown. Sure. Of well, we would like to think that we can offer everything, right? Yeah. But the uh, truth is that we offer a lot of things. Got right? it. You know, and so the whole concept here is if you're a small business, the complexities of technology today outweigh the cost. You're just not going to be able to hire all the folks in-house. That's where Merit comes in. So is it a help desk? Is it help desk for Microsoft products only? Is it a help desk for Google? Or do you need disaster recovery planning. What is it that you really need? So we looked at the complete spectrum and we have a VCIO service that comes in and studies your business and then propose the type of technology that best meets your goals and your budget. Right. So we look at ourselves as your one-stop shop. You right. can come to us and we can configure your IT needs from a global perspective of what your needs might be. 
Good stuff. All right, let's talk about modernizing technology and all of our businesses. Man, I tell you what, like I said a minute ago, I'm not a techie guy, right? Um, however, it is obvious to me how fast you got to move to keep up with technology. There's not a day that goes by that I don't think, man, I wish I could do that or I wish I knew how to do that, right? So, you know, if I was to define it, I would say something really simple about moving from old software and hardware to uh, new innovative solutions that don't require people touching them, automated, right? That's oversimplification. What is it to you? Well, you know, automation means uh, several things to, you know, several different people, right? right. But in, in essence, you, you mentioned a, uh, a few minutes ago, you have to keep up. The days are gone where you can't rely on legacy systems because you'll be behind them. And so what we do is figure out um, exactly the processes in your company that you could automate and not have uh, somebody working on it. Mm -hmm. For example, things have gotten so complex now, you have a smartphone, your smartphone can notify you uh, when you walk by a Walmart that there's uh, right. a special running. So automation is um, the process of reducing your overall cost and and the software industry has migrated to to cloud and with cloud services um, you have a ton of different ways in which you can automate all right let's get into it abe uh, and let's start with remote technology more of us than ever before are working outside the office sure. i have a feeling it's probably true with you i know here uh, for us at sc biz that uh, we got most of our folks now are mm -hmm. working out of the <clears> office <throat> yeah so that technology is becoming more and more important. What do you see out there? Yes, for sure, because I think uh, the biggest um, benefit for remote technology is the reduction of cost. Um, you know, a lot of folks have good bandwidth now, connectivity to their homes, and that also could be a negative. You know, if you don't have good con connectivity, it could slow you down. But right. the connectivity has gotten really good these days. And uh, one of the greatest benefit to businesses is to be able to hire folks uh, and not have them move. Our company has remote employees that are out of state, full-time employees that work for Merit because we can leverage remote technology and get good people, and they don't have to be in Greenville. Right. So that's a huge advantage. Right. I think companies are probably going to find uh, that they can save on brick and mortar. Absolutely. Don't need as big an office space, right? Correct. Um, let's talk about cyber attacks. Okay. Cyber espionage. It seems that it never ends. It used to be all we had to worry about was somebody spamming us, right? Uh, phishing attempts, you know, spear phishing, that kind of thing. But now all of a sudden, uh, these problems are huge. Uh, we're talking foreign entities mm -hmm. uh, that are getting right. into cyber espionage right. bigger and bigger and bigger and it's a little scary to me, Abe. Yeah. Well, it's always been there for a long time, but it's yeah. become a media sensation right now, <laughs> right. right? And the other thing That's what we, we do, we sensationalize. <laughs> the, Go other, ahead. the other thing is <clears throat> you know, what we have is um, the internet is growing. The number of devices on the internet grows exponentially now. Um, there's a study recently, uh, 2019 study, that uh, that does 22 billion billion with a B devices are now connected to the internet. So it, you know, the sheer volume of folks getting on the internet and software that's on the internet makes it uh, a daunting task. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you have free software somebody can come on and learn how to hack you with free software. It's called Script Kitties. They're out there. They want to try their hand at how to get into your network. Hundreds and thousands of those folks exist. Right. So we have a situation where we're playing catch up, you know, cat and mouse game, but businesses that don't pay attention to this, they are, they are putting themselves in huge risk, especially um, the risk of litigation. Mm -hmm. and, and what we do is to come in there and, and study what you have and then propose different solutions to limit your risk. We can never completely get rid of the risk. It exists, but you have to mitigate it and reduce as much as you can. It's, all, it's on employees a lot, right? I yes. mean, they got to do their part. Yes, they do. Education, um, you have to have policies, but you have to educate the employees. Um, and Merit is engaged in doing some of those right now, educating large bodies of employees uh, on what they should do and what they shouldn't do and what to be aware of. Right. Like you might get an email with an attachment and it looks like it came from your president. 
Yeah. Right? You yeah. click on that attachment, what happens? Yeah. Well, some ransomware gets on your system, and before you know it, it's cost you thousands of dollars to get everything back. Right. So you do have to pay attention to this, and um, and if you don't, it's it's a costly thing. You know, I, you mentioned ransomware. I, I, I read an article here recently that said malware uh, in 2020 increased 358 percent year over year, and ransomware up 435 percent year over year. So if I'm thinking about companies that need to mitigate these issues a little bit, I go to small companies, and I think. Can they afford it? I mean, what can they afford? What can they do that's within their budget? That's a great question. And the question I ask a company when they think about affordability is, can you afford not to? Yeah. Um, the good news is that software tools and the, and the knowledge to offer some basic security exist without a high price tag to it. That's the good news. Um, when you're faced with some kind of litigation, uh, what what a court wants to see is, are you employing some sort of best practices in your company for security? If you don't have that, the chances are it's going to be a whole lot worse for you. So to answer your question, it doesn't have to be expensive. You can do things wisely and correctly, but the real problem is educating people to constantly be watching out for these types of attacks. Right. Right. You mentioned a minute ago, so many things now are connected to the internet. Right. So many things connected to the internet, hence the new term, internet of things. Yes. I guess it's not quite new. It's been around for quite a few years now. Mm -hmm. But IoT, or internet right. of things, it's changed the way we think about things. Yes, it's it changed the way we do things. What do you see out there? Well, that's a fascinating. It's a double-edged sword. It's good and bad, like yeah. everything else, right? So the manual process is a human being. A human being sits in front of an internet uh, computer that's attached to the internet and he's going to or she's going to send and receive data. Right. Well, now you have chips that are embedded in devices that are sending and receiving data, and millions of them, right? But why are we collecting all this data? Well, this, this data is important to companies because they do trend analysis. They, they analyze this data to make predictive decisions on what they need to do. And that's why they're collecting tons and tons of data Right, I'll give you an example. Uh, we experimented with Internet of Things with one of our software products. Uh, we have an environment health safety product, and we had a little belt and an IoT device in the belt. And the whole idea was um, when a construction worker is on a dangerous site, we want to collect information on the temperature, the height that that worker was at, and how long he's at that place. Mm -hmm. If he had an accident and that IoT device reported that there's no motion for 30 minutes, it'll alert some safety director that something's wrong. Right. Go check on that person. Right. So that's a huge benefit uh, of an IoT device. And, and using it wisely um, certainly can reduce costs, liability, right. and obviously in this case, save a life. Right. Lots of expense savings, yes. uh, lots of revenue opportunities, but it requires an investment up front. And so uh, I think we see a lot more of the large companies beginning to get into this type of thing. What types of industries are you seeing that are really turning to IoT? Well, a lot of it is uh, manufacturing, yeah. uh, manufacturing, construction, mm -hmm. um, where you are wanting to collect uh, external information, um, like I was mentioning, temperature, you, um, different elements that will help you change your decisions or make decisions, allow you to do those things. Um, you also see them in asset tracking. Uh, for example, in the airline industry, I think it's um, one of the major airlines, um, they have a locking system that has an IoT device in it, right? If it's tampered with any unauthorized, or if the package goes anywhere where it's not supposed to be, well, the IoT device will alert, alert them and they would know that something's wrong with that package. Mm -hmm. So you can see how IoT is playing a huge role in, in cost savings um, and certainly reducing the risk. You know, I wish I could say something really smart and insightful about IPv6, 
but I cannot because I have no idea what it is, but I know it's somewhat important. Now you're telling me about it. Okay, so, you know, we're taking a deep dive into the history, right? Yes, so yes. the Internet is IP, Internet Protocol. So when it first came out in the 70s by DARPA, which is the, uh, an arm of the military, they never thought that they would see 4 billion devices on the Internet. Mm -hmm. Right, they just didn't see it. So it's an addressing problem um, that they're trying to solve right now. So IP4 is a 32-bit numeric address. IP6 is a 128-bit alphanumeric address. So if you think about it, uh, if you're running out of zip, you know, zip codes, what do you do? You add a maybe another four digits, and all of a sudden, you have mm -hmm. a whole lot more zip codes to play around. It's the same concept. Now, there are some problems. Okay, so uh, to go to IP6, it's, it's going to happen. There's no way you can get around it, but you have to think about cost, migration issues. You're going to have two protocols running it in your network at the same time. That could cause some issues. So there are some things that IT professionals really need to think about, um, and, and come up with a good strategy to make a smooth migration happen. Let's talk about artificial intelligence. This is becoming big, and of course, we, you know, we do a whole lot of work in the manufacturing industry, large manufacturing conference that we put on every year, and artificial intelligence has really been growing within that industry. But is it only in the biggest industries? Do you only find AI there, or how can small to medium-sized businesses take advantage of that technology? Well, I think, um, again, AI is, it means several things to several people, Rick, yeah. you know, but uh, today artificial intelligence is here to stay. Your phone is somewhat intelligent. Autocorrect is using AI. Your phone will try to predict what is the word you're trying to type. So there you have it, right? So of course, small businesses can capitalize on AI. A good example is your websites. Do you have an automatic um, digital assistant um, showing up when somebody new comes to your site and interacting with that human and getting the human the right type of information that they need. That is inexpensive. Right. And it's yeah, almost, good point. you know, you almost need it. Right. Um, otherwise, you'll lose connection with that person. But it's not another person on the other side doing it. It's AI doing it. Right, right. That's a good point. I think so often that when I think of AI, I think of something a whole lot bigger and more sinister, but it's not always that kind of thing. That is correct. Okay, Abe, let's move on, and we're moving quickly here because we have so many things I want to talk uh, to Abe about, but let's talk about privacy issues. Um, I think the more technology uh, that exists, the bigger that technology gets, and we're talking things like big brother, big data kind of stuff, right? Um, privacy becomes an issue, social yeah. media privacy sure. and other things. Sure. Tell me about that. Well, you know, technology is the culprit to erode privacy. Right. right. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's take your phone, for example. I mean, it's not really a phone. It's a little computer that you're carrying. Well, why should it have a camera? Oh. But we're so used to it today, right? Mm -hmm. Now, it's so easy to take a picture, and before you know it, know it, it's online for millions of people to see it. Yeah. So the question isn't uh, really about how do you protect your privacy, is what is acceptable and what is not. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, and as a business, you have to have some policies in place to let your employees know, hey, it's not good to take pictures inside of a business and post it online on your private Facebook. So having policies are very important right now to protect yourself as a business, and that's the perspective that I want to talk about. Because so many times people don't realize what they're doing, and they expose business inside secrets unknowingly to the external world. And that could be a huge problem. But we live in this world today. There's no way around it. Um, I don't think that, um, I mean, it's a bigger topic. I think that's, that's a, a topic that needs to be constantly addressed. You know, privacy, is it, is it loss of privacy? Or is it how much is good, how much is not good? But it's a very difficult question to answer. You might go to an to, uh, event, and somebody took your picture, and next thing you know it, it's on their website, it's on LinkedIn, it's on Facebook, and you meant that to be a private thing. Mm -hmm. You didn't really want the rest of the world to knew, know that you went to that event. Right. What do you do at that point? 
And what is your, um, you know, discourse in trying to prevent that from happening? Mm -hmm. There's not a whole lot, right? Mm -hmm. So, so what do you do? How do you help people with that? You have to educate them. Mm -hmm. You have to let. Um, unfortunately, um, there is a trend towards accepting the loss of privacy as being okay. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, I don't know necessarily if that's a good thing because if it does go into wrong hands. Uh, how many times have we heard stories about somebody posting something that they just meant innocently on Facebook and then that ended up them losing their job because it was a liability issue? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a loss of privacy, right? Right. So to deal with it, I think the best way to do it is have policies, policies that make sense in your company, educate your employees, educate yourself, um, and uh, it's a whole lot of education that goes into all of that. Right mentioned big data a minute ago, and right. it's the same thing, right? It, right. It, it, it's just the expansion on the idea of big data, and, and which basically uh, uh, defines uh, companies, large companies' attempts at gathering as much information sure. about us as they possibly right. can. People like Googles, the right. Googles of the world, right. right? Really scary stuff. Talk about big data. Uh, yeah, it is Internet of Things, like we mentioned before. Uh, they're constantly watching what you do, where you go. Your smartphone is actually reporting things when you go to a website. It's tracking you, um, and it comes down to uh, they're, they're using the, the technology today to offer services to you without question. However, it can be detriment to you as well. You know, you might, for, for let's, let's talk about politics for a minute, right? right. You, might have, right. Uh, you might be a member of a certain party, well, if you show up and big data is collecting the information about what you do, that could be used against you, right? right. So I, I, I think that, again, um, we are in a stage in, in, in technology where uh, it's important to ask questions like, should there be some controls? Mm -hmm. And at what level should these controls be? Because convenience, sacrificing certain things for in the name of convenience may not be the best thing for for society you know mm -hmm. so we do need to have laws that protect us from um, basic uh, e you know erosion of privacy you know the thing that concerns me and frustrates me most about the big data type of conversation is people are now fed more and more information that only aligns with how they feel about things yeah. Right? They go out, they, they're on social media, they search for things, they go to certain internet sites, they read certain types of things, and then all of a sudden this automated machine knows what you like right, and, right. And, and how you think and what you agree with, and it just feeds you only that information, right. which I think has created you know, even more, and we see it in, in politics, which right. you mentioned, even created more a divide because of big data. That is true, Rick, and you might go look at a lawnmower, right, online. The next thing you know is you are getting emails with lawnmower ads. <laughs> right. right. Now, that's kind of creepy, mm -hmm. right? It is creepy. Oh, you might even, I mean, I've had situations where you might have a conversation with somebody about buying something, a conversation. Next thing you go and go online, you see ads popping up about that item that you were talking about. Yeah. So that's big data working to market stuff at you. Yeah. And it's all artificial intelligence, they're tracking everything you're doing to sell to you certain things to make sure that they're in your face with the things that you're interested in. Right. Years ago, George Orwell wrote uh, all about this, yeah. uh, about Big Brother, which uh, is exactly what we're looking at it now. Uh, let's move on. I want to talk about this, and I've got to look at this because uh, I won't remember it all. I want to talk about software as a service okay. versus platform as a service sure. versus infrastructure as a service. Sure. What did I just say? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's it's cloud computing, right? Okay. I mean, right. It, it is the culmination of the types of cloud computing you can do, right? Mm -hmm. So we have uh, we call it SaaS, PaaS, and EAS. Right, Got so it. SaaS, software as a service, that is the highest, if you look at a pyramid and you look at cloud computing, SaaS sits on the top. And then PaaS is the middle tier, 
and ES is the bottom, and I'll explain what that is. SaaS, we do SaaS, we develop SaaS-based application. Well, years ago, when you write software, you gotta buy the software, it comes in a package, you basically would install the compiler, you would install uh, the application that allows you to build that software on your PC or on your mini computer. And when you're done, you then would have to package it on a disk or upload it somewhere and somebody else can use that software. Well, when cloud became the mainstay, right, SaaS basically eliminates all of that. All you need is a computer, enough memory, a good connection to the internet, and you can access some of the best software available to you, salesforce.com. Mm -hmm. Merit has produced something called meritehs.com. Uh, PASS is the same concept, but it's for developers. All right, so it's platform. So again, it's not for the end user, it's for those who write software, same concept. They don't have to mess with dealing with packages and hardware and all that stuff. It's all virtualized, but they write software, they build it, they compile it, they run it all in the cloud. Mm -hmm. ES, you go lower and you have system administration, system admins we call them, working on the entire infrastructure that supports the other two. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the old days, you would have a network engineer go take a big black box, Dell, whatever, and put it on a rack and get his computer hooked up to it, configure it, and create that. All of that is virtualized. Mm -hmm. All of that is gone. Now it's all cloud-based. So you have ES, PaaS, and SaaS. How does the company decide which platform? Wow, that's a great question. <laughs> it's cost-driven. Yeah. You know, and um, a lot of software today is going SaaS-based, but should you be a PaaS as, as a... As a development company, it's, it's going to be what are the costs, what's the, what, what are the benefits and stuff like that. Right. You know? Small companies looking to modernize their business. What are you seeing out there? What's the things that, uh, that they want to do? What's, what's the big, uh, the most popular things they're looking toward? They can't do everything. Right. So security is big. You have to pay attention to that. Uh, the three things that Merit does, right? Merit looks at your data for data consistency, data integrity, and data security. So when we consult with a small business, we look at what's your budget, what's your goal, what do you want to automate, and and how to get there, right? right. So is it cloud computing? Like you don't, you know, do you need to go with Google or do you need to go with Microsoft? Well, that might be many reasons why you might choose Microsoft over Google. We help you work through those things. Abe, that is really good information. I appreciate it. We covered a lot of stuff. We did. We did. Appreciate you coming by. Thank you. Folks, that is Abe Varagese. He is the CEO and founder of Merit Technologies, which is located in Greenville, South Carolina, but doing business everywhere. Appreciate you joining us for another episode of Coffee With. Stick around on SC Biz TV for a little while. See if there's anything else you might like. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to our page. We'll see you next time.